Well, welcome to my little exploration of the rodent coil. Here's a picture. The rodent coil I built. I think it's actually quite an attractive thing. This particular coil has 120 turns, or points rather, of 24 gauge wire times two windings on a uh, plastic torus that was wrapped with electrical tape. And the whole thing, when it was completed, was given several coats of lacquer. Alrighty, moving on. I'd like to discuss some, a bit about the geometry of the coil. Now, on the left of the image here, we can see a normal solenoid type of coil, cylindrical coil. I call this an open geometry because the magnetic field extends away from the, the coil and, and surrounds the physical part of the coil. Now this can also be wound as a very short cylinder so that the coil looks like a ring. But even in this configuration, the magnetic field still extends outside of the, the wires of the, of the windings. Now we move to the middle image, and this is a typical toroidal coil with the windings as vertically as possible around the torus body. I call this a closed geometry because the magnetic field is contained mostly, or to the great, far great extent, within the body of the torus. Now going to the right, we have the, an image of the rodent coil, which is a hybrid geometry. It's semi-open and semi-closed. And because the, the windings are tilted over, from a typical toroidal fashion. They have characteristics of both the, the previous two types of coils. Towards the center of the rodent coil, this character is more like a solenoid. Um, the, the vertical line going through the coil is supposed to be blue, and that represents the magnetic field that's formed in the middle of the coil as you move out towards the outside of the coil, the magnetic field is twisted so that it now runs in, at the very outside of the coil, runs in a horizontal plane perpendicular to the magnetic field in the center of the coil and is contained, bent around, the line here is straight, tangent to the coil, but the magnetic field is actually bent so that it's retained within the body of the torus. The actual, and what happens between these two extremes is kind of vague. I'd like to uh, model this with a program called uh, Finite Element Magnetic Modeling, but I have yet to learn how to use it uh, sufficiently to do so. After finishing construction of the coil, I measured its parameters to be 3.4 ohms on each winding, 245 nanofarads on each winding, and 225 microhenries on each winding. When I put a sine wave input into one winding and ran the output of the other winding into an oscilloscope, a resonant peak at about 14 kilohertz was found. I modeled 
the parameters I just gave you, the electrical parameters in space, and found that this resonant peak matched very well with the space model. Now the waveforms in this image, the blue one on top, is a square wave input to one winding, and the bottom waveform, the red one, is the output of the second winding again directly into the oscilloscope. Now I, in this image here I have accentuated the slough on uh, the rise and fall time of the waveform so you can see it. Now with the sine wave input, the amplitude varied with the frequency up to a maximum amplitude, output amplitude at between 14 and 15 kilohertz. With the square wave input, something different happens. The peak of the spike the amplitude of the spike varies with the current going through the coil or the, the peak voltage applied by the square wave. And this does not vary with frequency. It varies only with the, uh, the voltage applied to the coil. So from a very low cycle rate of say like 10, 10 hertz all the way up to about 2 kilohertz the peak of the spike remains the same with square wave input. I think this is important if you're driving a magnet or another coil in the center of the coil to get that, that strong magnetic pulse which you get from um, the square wave input. At, and it's, the peak is always high, regardless of frequency.